Thank you. More than 40 years ago, we were able to see the Earth from space for the very first time. There it was, beautiful marble floating in the vastness of space. It's such a powerful image of both our limitations and our opportunities. I'm here today to share with you a story about the Sahara Forest Project. And I want to start by offering you another perspective of that beautiful marble. This is the Earth as a pie chart. It immediately becomes clear why it's called the Blue Planet, and it also becomes clear that there is a small fraction of all that water that does not contain salt. The areas in the pie chart constitute the framework for all living creatures, including a human population that is growing towards nine billion people. The general consensus is that we need to increase our food production with, let's say, 70% towards 2050. It will be a challenge to do so within this fraction of the pie chart. And it's not the only challenge. These graphs summarize some of the latest findings from well-established international expertise. So if we are going to increase our food production to feed a growing population, how are we going to do that without negatively affect energy consumption, CO2 emissions, water scarcity, and desertifications? I believe that there is a need for a more integrated approach to face these intertwined challenges. With a more integrated approach, I am convinced that trends can be turned. But it will need some rethinking. In the Sahara Forest Project, we have challenged ourselves to do just that. We have challenged ourselves to rethink the way we use our resources and to rethink the way we set up our production systems. The traditional extractive use of resources has led to unprecedented growth but also to some serious environmental and social challenges. For more than 25 years, a more sustainable use of resources has been set as a target, and it still remains a key concept in shaping our future. However, in a number of areas, aiming to achieve a sustainable balance will not be enough. In these areas, there is a need to realize a restorative use of resources for growth that counters environmental and social challenges. Traditionally, our production systems are set up as a rather linear process, transferring resources into products, but also ending up with some waste streams. In ecosystems, what is waste for one species is typically a very valuable resource for another species. So with nature as inspiration, the Sahara Forest Project is pushing towards integrated production systems to turn these waste streams into resource streams. So based on this thinking, we have set ourselves a pretty ambitious target. We want to enable restorative growth, revegetation, creation of green jobs through profitable production of food, biofuels, fresh water, and electricity. That is our ID. Now, I think we all can agree that that is a pretty bold ID, but I believe it's an ID with the power to become reality. How? Well, I'll start with the technologies. First, we have seawater-cooled greenhouses. These greenhouses utilize the salt water as a basis for cultivation of crops in hot, arid environments. The basic principle is that seawater runs down honeycombed cardboard pads at one end of the greenhouse. Solar-powered fans then draw the hot desert air through these wet pads and into the greenhouse. When this happens, parts of the salt water will evaporate as small freshwater droplets into the air, causing the air to become cooler and more humid. And this allows for good growing conditions inside the greenhouse. The greenhouse is also designed to, co to condense and collect part of these water droplets in the air, generating more fresh water for irrigation. After we use the salt water in the greenhouse, we are left with a slightly saltier brine then. By running the brine over hedges with evaporative pads outside the greenhouse, we are able to repeat the evaporation process and provide an environment also outside the greenhouse 
with higher humidity, shade, and, sh and shelter. It's not as efficient as the greenhouses, but it's also much less costly. Together with efficient watering techniques and soil reclamation techniques, this allows us to cultivate plants also in these hot, previously barren areas. Eventually, this brine will become too concentrated to continue the evaporation process. And the brine can then be left in traditional salt ponds and form the basis for ordinary salt production. The utilization of solar power is the third core technology of this system. Concentrate solar power is a solar technology with a huge potential. Mirrors are used to concentrate the energy from the sun, and this energy is used to produce superheated steam driving a conventional steam turbine. With water cooling, the energy efficiency of these technologies can be increased with up to 10%. And it also needs water for cleaning these mirrors. As a consequence, these facilities they should be located in sunny areas with low cost of land. But these areas, they often lack the freshwater resources. We believe we have found the answer to this challenge in our synergies. The concentrate solar power facility will deliver considerable amounts of surplus heat to be used for evaporation of additional seawater. It will also provide power for the electrical installations in the greenhouse, while the vast majority of the electricity can be exported to the grid. The concentrate solar power facility will benefit because the greenhouses and hedges, they can provide efficient water cooling, but with seawater. This means that fresh water is not wasted and we avoid constructing cooling towers. The new vegetation will help stabilize the soil and reduce the amounts of dust in there so that more direct sunlight reaches the mirrors. And the outside vegetation, that will benefit from the greenhouses and saltwater infrastructure as they create a humid and more beneficial growing environment. So why are all these technologies and synergies, why are they important? Because it allows us to use what we have enough of, like sunlight, like CO2, like deserts and saltwater to produce what we need more of, food, water, and energy. Once such a saltwater infrastructure has been established in the desert, it opens up for possibilities for including technological extensions. Earlier I mentioned salt production. Integration of mari culture and algae has also clear potential for cost reductions in such a system. The same goes for electri electricity from photovoltaic technologies. Another interesting opportunity is using the brine output from a desalination facility as a starting point for cooling of the greenhouses. Now, technologies are exciting, but they're not everything. And I believe that if a Sahara Forest Project facility should be successful, it needs to be well integrated with local communities. It needs to provide opportunities for jobs, for produce, and for knowledge transfer. So what about the bottom line? Well, most of the technologies in the Sahara Forest Project are in commercial operation as standalone facilities around the world. That's not a guarantee for success, but it is a very good starting point. The Sahara Forest Project is set up to utilize abundant land, plentiful renewable resources in combination with these technologies in markets with high demand for products. It's these elements combined that makes a powerful business case. We have set out to realize a triple bottom line. We want Starforce to be good for the environment, it needs to be good for people, and it needs to have that long-term financial viability. So the Star Forest project offers technological flexibility and scalability for adaptation to local needs and conditions. I want to share with you one large-scale scenario of 4,000 hectares of Sahara Forest Project facilities. And in this particular scenario, we have emphasized revegetation and production of food and biofuel in addition. As you might expect, these facilities would produce huge amounts of food, jobs, and renewable energy, fodder, and biofuel. But to me, the most exciting part of all this is that all of these values has the potential to be produced in a system 
where we store CO2 from the atmosphere through revegetation of arid areas. However, what really matters is, of course, if we can transform this idea into the reality on the ground. Think tanks are all well and good, but we want to be an action tank. We realized early on that if we should manage the transition of the Sahara Forest Project from slideware to hardware, we would need good partners. In 2011, we went into cooperation for Qatar with the fertilizer companies Yara International and Kafko. More than 60 scientists from 12 different countries were involved in making these feasibility studies. And yes, they were needed. And in February 2012, we were ready to move ahead. Together with Yara and Kafko, we set ourselves an extremely ambitious timeline. We want the first Sahara Forest Project facility to be up and running by December 2012. We want to prove that potential for rapid deployments. In May 2012, we start construction. And I won't lie to you, it was challenging, bringing all these technologies together under the hot Qatari sun at record speed. It was challenging, but it was also very rewarding. By the end of November 2012, we had reached that point where our ID had turned into reality. Since then, this site has been home to numerous scientists and experts conducting research programs and value engineering at a speed matching that of the construction phase. But let's have a look around. This is Qatar's first fully operational facility for concentrated solar power. The heat from the mirrors is used to generate energy for a desalination system for production of fresh water. Hedges with evaporative pads create a sheltered and humid environment. This is a thriving crop of barley. The more beneficial growing conditions do not only allow for cultivation of traditional crops, but also opens up the potential for cultivation of desert species. Many of these desert species has exciting potentials as new sources of biomass, of fodder for storing carbon and for soil conditioning. And in the greenhouse, salt water is used to produce evaporative cooling and humidification. So the effect is the crop's water requirements, they are minimized while maintaining high yields of the crops with a minimal carbon footprint. More than a quarter of a million cucumbers has been produced from this greenhouse. There are also facilities for cultivation of halophytes. This is plants with tolerance or even affinity for salt water. This means that we can grow additional biomass without using fresh water. And finally, there is integrated state-of-the-art facility for production of algae, the only one of its kind in Qatar and the wider region. I wish I could have brought all of you out there to see for yourself. But even I realize that that might be difficult. You might have plans this evening. But I couldn't quite let go of that idea. So though I can't bring all of you to the Sahara Forest Project, I thought I can bring a little bit of the Sahara Forest Project to you. So here you have it. A serving of algae from the desert, fresh water produced from salt water and sunlight, barley from previously banned land, and of course, a guest of honor, fresh restorative cucumbers. Since the early days of concept development, the Sahara Forest Project has been an amazing journey. It's been fantastic to see this idea transformed into the reality you see in front of you today. But this has only been the start of our journey. Now we are gearing up to play our part in addressing some of the toughest challenges out there. It will be difficult, but I believe it can be done. I believe we can realize a restorative growth. Thank you so much for your attention.